I have a session this afternoon at which I'll be talking about the, the details of how the JCP works, uh, how the organization is structured and functions and so on. So I'm not going to do that this morning. Instead, I'm going to do a history lesson. Uh, there'll be no test at the end of it. Um, but I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures and talk about things that happen in history uh, with the intention, I hope, of persuading you of the importance of standards. So let's start at the very beginning. Probably the very first standard of all was human language. If we all behaved the way Humpty Dumpty did and said words mean anything I want them to mean, then we would not be able to communicate with each other. There would be no such thing as human civilization. After we learned to speak, we learned to write, we learned to create number systems for counting, uh, and we created a medium of exchange, currency. Very important for the development of commerce. In the early days, currency actually had real physical value. These were real metal coins made out of gold or silver. And certainly in England, 17th century, there was a very nasty tendency. People would have what they call clipping. They would take a coin and they'd snip pieces off the edges and then they'd melt them all down and they would end up with uh, free gold or silver. But the effect of this, of course, is the debasement of the currency, which undermines the entire economic system, as we can see as is happening right now here today in the United States. Um, Sir Isaac Newton, that Sir Isaac Newton was appointed uh, master of the mint and given the job of defending the currency and hunting down people who were debasing it. And the death penalty was introduced for those who actually offended in this way. Some standards are so important that if you violate them, death is the penalty. So I thought, hmm, maybe for jcp.next, we should increase the penalties for those who uh, create incompatible <laughs> implementations of JSRs. Uh, we can talk more about that this afternoon. Give me your feedback and let me know whether you think this is a good idea or not. Uh, standards for time and for space, uh, also very important. Again, the very early days, astronomical time was really all that we cared about. Uh, if you knew when the solstice was, you knew when to plant your seeds and when to harvest and so on. But as we got better at measuring, time and space, we got better at navigation, and we learned to make accurate maps, and we could explore the world, and so on. Weights and measures, also fundamental. Sometimes it's enough to count a horse as a horse, of course, but sometimes you need to know how big something is. You don't know how much beer there is in a firkin, unless you know there are four firkins to a barrel. One of the early measures of distance was something called a rod, sometimes also called a pole or a perch. It was about 16 and a half feet. Um, Four rods make a chain, ten chains make a furlong. Uh, one furlong by one chain is a measure of an acre, and that's the amount of land that uh, one man could comfortably uh, could, uh, could plow in a day. Furlong, short for furrow long. Um, Sixteen and a half feet, how do you define that? Well, 1513 in Germany, they said, okay, we'll go to church on Sunday morning, We'll choose the first 16 guys who come out. We'll stand them in a line, measure the length of their feet, <clears throat> and that's what we will call a rod. We got a little more precise since then, measuring uh, distance in terms of astronomical units, uh, the speed of light, and so on, but the same principle applies. Middle Ages, the guilds, the, the craftsmen would get together. They would define standards for quality. They were very concerned that uh, the stuff that was produced and sold in their name actually had a certain amount of quality to it. They introduced the very first certification programs, hallmarks, you can think of them as something like a trademark, uh, a measure of quality, still in use today for gold and silver. Printing, the first form of mass production. Before printing press was invented, every book was unique. Uh, afterwards, you have standardization, standardization of uh, paper sizes, of fonts, and even of the language itself, the way the words are actually spelt. There are certain areas I mentioned earlier, currency, where the, the state, the government, steps in because they believe that the maintenance of standards is very important. Food and drugs, health and safety are similar areas where over time the state imposes regulations uh, in order to prevent the adulteration of food, uh, protection of health and safety in the workplace, and so on. So let's move on a little more to, to modern times. Uh, talked about currency and the importance of currency, how you can't really develop industry without it. Similarly, um, accounting principles, principles of accounting, the ways that you draw up your books, needs to be standardized, otherwise you can't have commerce. 
joint stock companies, the early version, uh, the precursor of the modern corporation, there are a whole bunch of rules and regulations around how these can be formed, how they must operate, and again, without this, industry really does not develop very well. With these foundations, we can move into the machine age, when you invent machine tools, uh, lathes, planes, cutting instruments, and so on, you begin to need much more precision, and you begin to think about standardization. Let's take something very simple, or apparently simple, screws and threads. One of the master machinists in the 19th century in England was a guy called Henry Maudsley. There was a guy who worked for him called Joseph Whitworth, and uh, Maudsley started to standardize within his own workshop screws and threads, so that the parts became interchangeable. But Whitworth took this further and created a national standard uh, for screws and threads that's still in use today. If you go out to a do-it-yourself shop in England, try and buy a socket wrench, they'll ask you, do you want Whitworth thread or do you want metric? This enabled the production of steam engines. We can move on to the railways. This is Stevenson's rocket, the first uh, real uh, steam engine. The introduction of the railways introduced standardization in a whole variety of areas, not just uh, kind of physical things like the, the width of the, the rails, but also uh, management processes to actually run these enterprises that would span the entire country and later a whole continent, and even down to time itself. Before the railway was introduced, every town and village in England had its own separate time, because basically what they would do is they look up ahead. When the sun is overhead, that's noon. Well, depending on where you are, of course, time is going to be different. You can't run a railway that way. Can you imagine trying to put together a timetable when, you know, uh, every 12 miles in the east-west direction, uh, there's a minute of difference? So the railway companies got together, said we need a standard form of time. Greenwich Mean Time was created, later endorsed by the government. This happened mid-19th century in England, a few decades later in the United States. But again, the railways were the guys who said, we have to agree on a standard for time. We have to agree when it is midday. So, what's the essence of what we're talking about here? It's really interchangeable parts. You probably heard the name Eli Whitney. He was the guy who invented the cotton gin machine for getting seeds out of cotton. But he won a contract. He was a, a machinist, of, worked in various areas. He won a contract from the uh, newly formed, uh, newly independent United States government to deliver 30,000 muskets. And he won the contract primarily because he claimed that he was going to create or build these muskets with interchangeable parts instead of them making them by hand so that every piece was slightly different. Now, it's not clear, in fact, whether he was telling the truth about this. Uh, some people say that he never actually did deliver muskets that were built out of interchangeable parts, but he certainly promoted the idea and it caught on. We know where it led. This is uh, Henry Ford's first production line, Dearborn, 1913. So let's move on into the computer age, the very first computer. Uh, I mentioned uh, Joseph Whitworth, the machinist who worked for Maudsley. He ended up working for Charles Babbage and helping to build this uh, difference engine, the very first computer ever constructed, uh, made out of brass and steel, carefully machined parts, uh, operated, programmed via punch cards. Never actually completed. Some people say that, uh, that Babbage that the precision that he required of the parts could not be maintained with the machine tools they had at the time. But uh, the 200th anniversary of his birth, excuse me, yes, his birth in 1991, Science Museum in London uh, took his blueprints and actually constructed a machine. They found a couple of small bugs, but basically it worked. There's another one in the uh, Computer History Museum down in Mountain View, near where I live, well worth looking at. As I said, programmed via punch cards, which was, uh, had been in use for many years in the Jacquard loom uh, for weaving complex patterns into cloth. This is Monsieur Jacquard explaining and demonstrating his invention to Napoleon. It's not clear whether IBM pays royalties to Jacquard's uh, ancestors, uh, but perhaps he should. Uh, to have real computers, of course, modern computers, we need electricity. The very first standards war. Uh, was probably Tesla versus Edison, uh, alternating current or direct current. Tesla won that one. This is Tesla in his lab in Colorado, but it's a, it's a what do they call it, multi-exposure photograph. That, that lightning bolt was not there while he was actually sitting there. 
But uh, yeah, Tesla won that particular standards war. Edison, of course, went on to promote the telegraph, which led us from telephones to cell phones, telecommunications. These, these are all areas in which the very first international standards organizations were formed. Nobody wants a telephone that can't communicate with another telephone. So the International Telegraphic Union formed, I think, 1870-something, probably the very first uh, international standards organization. <coughs> Standards are not just about kind of technology and so on. Standards apply in everyday life. Uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology was asked by the US government to uh, create instruments for measuring the alcoholic content of beer because the government wanted to tax beer and you had to agree on you know, the level of alcohol content so you knew how much to tax. NIST similarly was involved in defining standards for ladies' clothing so that you could have a particular size and know that when you bought it there was some chance that it would fit. Traffic, we have to agree which side of the road we drive on, what the traffic signs mean, otherwise there'd be chaos. Simple, apparently simple invention like the shipping container. Standardized sizes enable us to ship goods from China to here for next to nothing. Think of it as a packet switching for physical goods. Amazing invention, uh, requires standardization. Postage, uh, back in the early days, International Postal Union was formed. Agreement among all the countries. Think about it. You put a postage stamp on a package in one country, it makes its way halfway across the world, gets delivered at the other end. Everybody along the way takes their cut of the five pennies or whatever you spent to ship it. All of that was done through international organization called the Universal Postal Union. Music. We couldn't have music if we didn't agree on how the notes should sound. So there's an ANSI standard for the note A above middle C, 440 hertz, ISO 16. Color, what is red, how blue is blue, uh, www.color.org, International Color Union. Chocolate, what is chocolate? Chocolate is formally defined by the World Health Organization Food and Agriculture Organization in the US by the Food and Drug Administration. Must contain a certain amount of cocoa fat and butter, solids, and so on. A few years ago, the chocolate manufacturers tried to change the rules to allow them to create so-called chocolate without cocoa products in it. There was a mass uprising. Go Google the phrase, don't mess with our chocolate, and you'll see. They had to back down. Sport, uh, I don't know about American football pitch, but I can tell you a cricket pitch is one chain in length. Remember, a chain is uh, four rods, 22 yards. You've got to have rules, otherwise the game doesn't mean anything. Again, standards, formal standard for the rules of cricket. Medicine, we've got to agree on what we call a disease, World Health Organization classification. Shopping, barcodes. Specialized barcodes for books, ISBN. Home entertainment systems, there's another standards war. We know who won this one, Blu-ray with Java inside, yay. Beat out, HD, DVD. Sometimes we create standards because they help to promote industry. Sometimes we do it because something went wrong and we realized we really screwed up. Baltimore, 1904, big fire, $150 million worth of damage done. They bring in these fire engines from all the surrounding cities. Guess what? They couldn't plug their hoses into the hydrants because there was no agreement on the coupling mechanism. After that, they said, might be a good idea if we standardize that. Mars Orbiter, 1999. Nine months to get there, boom, <coughs> fails. Because the guys who programmed it were using imperial measurements and the guys who built the hardware were using metric measurements. Oops, we didn't have an agreement. So what it's really all about is, are we artisans? Do we create stuff lovingly by hand? I used to woodwork, it's great fun, you know. Uh, or are we engineers? Do we take things that have been pre-constructed and do we kind of put them together? It's perhaps less fun to do it the engineering way, but if you want to build real stuff, that's the only way to do it. So, standards make the world go round. In the computer industry, we got standards for languages and protocols, we got standards for interfaces. Specifications are at the heart of it. Specification is really like a blueprint a description of how something should be. The description in itself is not enough. You've got to have a testing process. I've got a uh, blueprint here for a helicopter, but if I say it requires an anti-gravity machine to make it lift off the ground, guess what? I'm not going to be able to build it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so certification processes help us to ensure that. If you do this right, then you're not locked into a particular vendor. You can interchange your parts for your computer system the same way that we could interchange physical parts in, in, in industry. Uh, people like that. They don't like to be locked in. So you want to build industrial strength systems that span the globe, build them out of standardized pieces, use standards, and you'll be more successful. 
in the Java world, the JCP is the way we do this. As I said, I'm talking this afternoon, I'll give you more details, but basically a formal process for defining specifications and moving them through the process, voting on them, reviewing them at various stages. <coughs> Three deliverables, not just a specification, but also a reference implementation, which is a proof that you can actually build the, uh, the specification. Uh, conformance test suite to measure stuff to make sure that it actually conforms to the spec. And you've got to create all these three things simultaneously, and they all support each other, kind of like three legs of a stool. Right, JSR 348 uh, is our attempt, our current process to modify the process. We use the process itself to change the process. Uh, so there is like a formal way of, of changing the constitution. Uh, the themes of this particular release, uh, this particular version, which we're trying to do pretty quickly, finish by October. Again, I'll say more about it this afternoon, but transparency, doing stuff out in the open instead of in smoke-filled rooms. Uh, participation, making sure there are no barriers that prevent people from joining in and participating and helping. And agility, trying to make sure that we do things uh, fast and uh, smoothly. So, um, I want your help here. I want you to, first of all, go and check out what we're doing with JSR 348, give us your feedback, and more importantly, uh, participate in the process itself. You might say, why should I? But uh, this is an open source conference, so I guess everybody understands the value of participating. And you're not necessarily doing it out of altruistic motives. You may be doing it because you're gonna get a better job at the end of it. If your name is on a well-used piece of open source software, if your name is on a specification that is widely used, well, guess what? You know, your job prospects are gonna be better than they otherwise were. So, encourage you to participate. We call it the Java community process. Uh, we want it to be a community process. It's not just for the big boys, not just for the uh, big corporations, but uh, we want you guys too. That's it, that's all I have to say. Three minutes to spare, thank you. <laughs>